Well, it's 10 o'clock, so we'll make a start. No doubt there'll be a few people arriving in as we go. It's really good to see you for the first of six webinars that we'll be doing over this next academic year. Thank you for joining us. And as always, we look forward to interacting with you. Um, for those of you who I've not met, I'm Pam McNaughton. I've been working for CPAS for the last nine years. Um, and I work particularly with lay people and clergy and multi-parish benefices. If you don't know about CPAS, you can find out more about us on our website, but we have three main areas of work. Um, we lead holidays for children, Christian holidays for children and young people in the summer. And it was good to see those going back on site in a big way this last summer. We are patrons of around 700 churches. So we're involved in the appointing of vicars in those places. Um, and then the bit that Matt and I are involved in is training lay people and uh, clergy in leadership skills. So before I go any further, let me ask Matt to introduce himself. Hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Matt Hogg. I am a leadership enabler at CPAS. I've been with CPAS for a year now. And, um, you know, we've, we've experienced multiple crisis and, and change and challenge over the last few years. It's affected, you know, us personally, but also collectively. And the world is different to this time three years ago. And this is, you know, the new reality we find ourselves in. And it can feel a bit daunting. Um, so this webinar, what we're going to be doing is it's, it's not the whole story by any means, but we want to share five practical, realistic ways that churches and leaders can begin to thrive in this era of sustained uncertainty and growing opportunity. We hope it will be some encouragement to you and aid your own continued learning and reflection. Thank you, Matt. Um, so our, what's going to happen is that Matt's got some input for us. After that, we're going to break out rooms to share our experiences and our insights and our thoughts on what he said. And then we'll come back for 20 minutes of questions at the end. We will finish promptly at 11 o'clock. But if you want to stay on, we will hang around for a bit later um, if you want to ask further questions or have further discussion. So before I hand over to Matt for his input, let's pray for our time together. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Lord God, whatever we bring with us this morning, we thank you for this reminder that it's all about you and your love for us. And as we share and talk and learn together this morning, we pray that your spirit will be wor at work in us, that we will know more deeply your love for us and that we will encourage each other in our work and in our leading. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Matt, over to you. Well, thank you, Pam, and great to see you all here. Thanks so much for um, carving out some time in your uh, in your diary today. So, I'm just going to share my uh, my screen, and um, and here we go. I'm just going to share this. We've just had a passage read to us, but this is a passage I'd love to um, to uh, to have a quick look at. Uh, Acts two. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe um, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. 
And uh, that's something so, there's something so you know inspiring about that familiar passage, isn't it? It's it's a picture of of the kingdom of heaven advancing and the body of Christ thriving. But as we as we read the pa pages of the New Testament, we often see that it's in the face of challenge and adversity. It's a, it's a paradox of the kingdom of heaven, if, if, if you will. But, you know, it's the smallest of seeds that become the largest of garden plants. It's, a, it's strength in the midst of weakness. It's, it's death and yet resurrection. And, um, and, and as leaders, it's um, an important part of our role is to point people to the reality of God's kingdom, to remind people of what's true. Um, and so just to put this here as a sort of a, a starting point, that leaders name reality, but also to name the reality of our context, not to, to sugarcoat it or to hype anything up, but to describe under God the reality of what is uh, and, and in the environment in which we lead. Now, I put myself back to this day, 27th of September, 2019, three years ago. OK, so it was a Friday. It's a quiet day of emails, some admin, some prayer, a, a visit or two in, in parish when I was leading a, a church in, in, in Fulham. I was there for about 11 years after planting. Um, and it was, you know, final preparation before the weekly services. You know, ah, 2019. You can look back to that time. <laughs> now, of course, there were there were challenges at the time, but goodness, haven't things changed in society and our world um, in just three years? Think of the multi-layered consecutive crises that we've we've gone through: COVID, climate, cost of living, conflict. Add into that the change of social social isolation, social justice movements. More recently, you know, change of monarchy, but also throughout political uncertainty. There will be specific realities important to your context as well, which, which are important to name and to acknowledge. And um, by way of illustration, I, um, uh, I thought I'd love to use two poles just to name or, uh, or, you know, or describe the reality of our own situations that are current for you in your leadership. OK, so a poll's going to come up and this is uh, there's a there's a more personal one about you as a leader. How are you feeling? First of all, are you at the start of this term running on empty or would you say you're full of beans on the other end of the scale? This is a poll that's going to come up. And then the second one is about what's what are your um, what would you say your key challenges are on your radar as a leader over the next six to 12 months? But firstly, the first poll I think is going to come up. Let me um, let's uh, take this off screen share. How would you rate? Um, uh, hang on, how, how, where have we got to? Okay, so the first question, where are you on the scale as a leader? Running on empty or full of, full of beans? We, we seem to have the feedback poll, ah. or I do anyway. I think that is correct. Kirsty, any chance you help us with the other poll? Let's just see if anything comes up. Just... Um, Bear with us for a moment. Let's see if there's anything coming up now. Haha, here we go. Thanks, Kirsty. Here we go. So, first question Where are you on the scale personally as a leader? Running on empty or full of beans on the other end? Just, uh, it, you know, this is an opportunity to name reality. There's no uh, there's no judgment here. It's just an opportunity for us to acknowledge, you know, there'll be a variety. Um, there'll be a variety of responses. So feel free to post. This isn't going to be graded. We're not going to be uh, identifying you and following you up. Um, it's just an anonymous poll just to see um, see what kind of spread we've got in the room. And um, that's really, really helpful. And then as well, over the next six to 12 months, what would you say are the key challenges on your radar as a leader? And we have some people filling that out as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll give you a moment or two. If you haven't yet filled that out, we've got some people filling these out, which is excellent. Good work. It's really helpful just to see some of that. We may refer back to some of this later on, but this is, this is so, so helpful. Thank you for, for filling that out. This, um, 
yeah, that's great. I think we've pretty much well completed that. Thank you for, for filling, filling that out. I think, you know, it's just worth saying, this is the environment in which we live, we minister and we lead. This, you know, this is at least some of the reality that describes our context, both the broader picture, but also the more local picture as well. And the reality is that um, it's, it's quite complex, <laughs> isn't it really? It's quite complex. Um, and um, here we go. I'm going to uh, um, bring up my screen again. Um, let's uh... actually did did we have we shared the results of the poll? Is it just me that can see this? Need to share them. Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's before we move on. Let me share. I just realised that I need to share that. Can you see that? This coming up. Where are you on the scale? Personally, as a leader, running on empty. I'm just ho I'm hoping that I'm, you can see this um there's a there's a bit of an even distribution there um and um you know a real spread and then further down over the next six to 12 months what would you say are the key challenges on your radar as a leader mobilizing volunteers would be up there church finances would come in number two um navigating cost of living crisis and then other be interesting to find out what um people would say under other as well but let me um let's move on in our um, time together. The reality is that the context we're leading in is complex. In, in, the, um, in the summer of 2020, I put out a poll on, on social media asking, how are you feeling about this, um, in, about this moment? Is this a cultural tipping point in culture? This is, the, this is what I put out on, on Instagram. And, um, I, I, looking back, I think I slightly don't even know what that meant, but there was something of a recognition that uh, that there were tectonic plates shifting in society in you know time of political change. It's the Black Lives Matter movement. Hidden injustices were being revealed. It's lockdown. People responded um, with this: that ninety-two percent thought that this was a cultural tipping point. They ticked yes. And last week, this was, that was a couple of years ago, uh, just last week um, or a couple of weeks ago, uh, I noticed on, on, um, on the day of Queen Elizabeth's death, uh, I saw a tweet from someone on Twitter, a millennial I follow who I connected with through, um, through Spring Harvest, which communicates something of the sentiment that younger generations hold. This is what she said. The only thing my generation has not seen is an alien invasion just recognizing that there is just such, we have been through such upheaval over the last few years. And you can see, you know, 113,000 likes um, suggest that this resonated with the sentiment behind a lot of people. And you will likely have heard the acronym before that this is a VUCA world. The reality of the world that we live in is, is a VUCA world. Um, an acronym coined by futurist Bob Johansson, who, uh, who says that after centuries of stability and slow incremental change, in less than a generation, our world has become volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Now, I don't entirely like the acronym, but I think it communicates what we're, what we're all living in and through. And in the last lead on, Adrian Locke, who I think is here, here today, uh, co-founder of Enabled Leaders, adds a G to, to make VUCA G, that we're globally connected as well, just to, just to sort of throw into the mix that we are um, living and, and leading in this, in this context. And we can forget waiting, really, for the new normal, as um, Graham Archer, Interim Director, um, of CPS said recently, uh, the uncertainty is our new normal. This is the reality in which we lead. And so it goes without saying that as leaders, we've had to navigate a lot of change. And, and of course, when we're thinking about change, I, I often think about the Kubler-Ross change curve as a useful reminder of what happens when we go through change. So obviously there are different stages of change. You'll be familiar with it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, the, the form of, of shock and denial about the disruption to the status quo, through to anger and fear, and then through to acceptance and commitment. But, but um, you know, as, as we've said, a VUCA world of consecutive crises is what we're living in. That's the context, which means 
represented in this room will be people at every stage of the change curve on this call today. It also means that in our congregations, in our communities and wider denominational context, there'll be people at every stage of the change curve. And the change curve for me explains the range of emotions that we and our people have experienced over the last few years. You, you may have noticed yourself feeling optimistic and hopeful and energized on the one hand, and a, maybe a bit lonely, dispirited, tired and confused, out of your depth even, the next. Sometimes that's all on the same day. And the question that we want to ask ourselves is, while the landscape is ever changing, with the constant challenges coming our way, can we thrive in this new reality? And if so, how? And so the best answer to any difficult question is of course, another question. <laughs> uh, and of course the question is, what do we mean by thriving? Because you'll get different answers depending on what you're measuring and what you value. So, for example, thriving and flourishing in life is, is such an important cultural um, narrative right now. Our people will be told that they, they need to live their best life, to be true to themselves, to not be hindered by anything, to just go for it, to seek success, to be the best. And sometimes this can flow over into our own leadership. The, you know, thriving often means success, growth, increase, the up and to the right curve. Nick Cuthbert in, um, in his book, How to Thrive, Su Survive and Thrive as a Church Leader, um, he says many books read by Christian leaders are accounts of apparently successful churches where the definition of success nearly always has to do with size and influence, which can sometimes lead to a sense of competition, um, perhaps in our hearts silently, you know, we sink when we hear of another church doing amazing work. But let me um, let me share with you the biblical picture of thriving and flourishing as far as I understand it. You know, aside from the botanic metaphors that we find in the Old Testament describing the flourishing life of the righteous person, um, the New Testament picture we see is, is the fruitfulness and growth that comes through God's kingdom. And so we read about the word of God transforming hearts and minds, the, the fruit-filled life that comes from abiding in the vine we had uh, that passage read uh, uh, earlier on the you know the fruit of the spirit um the word of god spreading throughout the regions we're told as we read acts the the increase in numbers as a result of god's work and the picture is of the kingdom of god flourishing the word of god thriving in the hearts and minds of believers and, and the fact that we're all here on this call is is the, you know with a story of God's transformation in our hearts is testament to the fact that the kingdom of God is flourishing is thriving as we've been incorporated into the one holy catholic apostolic church and yet there's that very real sense that God's mission isn't yet complete the missio dei continues we're caught up in the in the pain but also the beauty of the here and arriving kingdom of God the the now and the not yet and while we may face challenges locally, God's kingdom thrives. We see something of that in, in the New Testament, don't we? You know, the apostles in prison, Paul caught up in riots, you know, heretics right there at the, at the door, persecution. And yet somehow the church grew, the word of the Lord spread throughout the regions. And so I would like to suggest five ways that, we as leaders can thrive in this new reality if it, you know forgive me that it rather sounds like a bit of a quick fix you know <laughs> do these five things and you will be sorted of course there's no silver bullet at all um, but through the unknowns and changing landscape we want to we of course want to lead well both ourselves but also our churches in mission and discipleship and and these five things might be able to refocus you and help promote flourishing or thriving in your own leadership and churches as you continue your own reflection and learning. Uh, maybe this is just a bit of extra fuel for your for your for your own reflection and and um, and uh, uh, it, you know leaning into this stuff as well. So, firstly, I'd like to suggest um, thrive thrive personally, and as we've 
said since the webinars began, taking care of ourselves, that's so, so important. And just a reminder that it's just as important now as it ever has been. The Church of England um, did some interesting re research highlighting some key things that help clergy thrive. Some of those things were healthy rhythms, handling expectations, healthy boundaries, recognizing vulnerability, and other things as well. Really helpful report. We'll put it on the resources sheet that we'll send out. Now, there's nothing new here, but this is just a reminder for us that in the busyness of September, just not to forget these things. Simple as that. Are you resting, praying, abiding with the Lord? What about spiritual disciplines? And it's, it's so easy for us to teach others and yet not to apply some of this to ourselves. So interesting, uh, um, the 18th century um, theologian Jonathan Edwards, um, he identified 70 resolutions that he would use to inquire of himself. Um, and these were a few that, that struck me recently. Resolution seven, he said, resolved never to do anything that I should be afraid to do if it were, if it were the last hour of my life. Number 40 of his resolutions, he resolved to inquire every night before I go to bed whether I have acted in the best way I possibly could with respect to eating and drinking. Resolution 42, uh, uh, this is the third of the three I wanted to share with you. Um, he resolved frequently to renew the dedication of myself to God, which was made at my baptism. So thriving personally thrive vocationally now with all the the turmoil and challenge that confronts us day to day it can be very easy to lose sight of the vocation um, and the calling that god has placed upon our lives um, but as leaders but also to just to remind to step back and remember oh yes this this is what it's all about and so you know journaling so so helpful spiritual director again so helpful prayer dates um, or, or retreats are they booked into your diary yet for the next year when i was in parish i i went through a season and it does change doesn't it so you have to identify what the what the season is but i found that it was for a time helpful just to get on a bus go down to brighton um, and not spend the day in brighton actually it was just spending time on the bus and just looking out the window with my bible with god and I just, for a season, I just found that so renewing and life-giving. It was also a little bit costly, so it probably didn't last very long <laughs> going down uh, on the bus. But I found that such a renewing time. And it may be some, there may be something that you um, have as well that is just a place where right now you sense God is meeting you. Lean into those moments. Because it's in these moments we're, rem rem we're reminded of who God is, who we are and our role and time and again i have found such a renewed sense of the things that god calls me to as i engage with those those things a helpful tool might be looking at some liturgy and and please forgive me for for a moment for being a bit anglican here um, for those who are ordained in the church of england in your ordination service we're, we're asked some searching questions will you be diligent in prayer in reading holy scripture and in all studies that will deepen your faith and fit you to bear witness to the truth of the gospel? Will you strive to make the love of Christ known through word and example and have a particular care for those in need? Will you be a faithful servant in the household of God after the example of Christ who came not to be served, but to serve? Will you then in the strength of the Holy Spirit continually stir up the gift of God that is in you to grow in holiness and grace. And so there are other questions that the bishop puts towards uh, the ordinance. And, and you'll remember that the response from the ordinance after each question is, by the help of God, I will. And the, and the key, of course, is that we need God's help. We need to make sure that we, we build into our calendars moments where we're reminded that it's not all down to us, but actually we can only do this with God's help. So thrive vocationally and then thrive relationally. Now, 
of course, relationally in the sense that we want to maintain good relations with those closest to us. But specifically, I'm thinking about this from a leadership perspective. We, you know, we need each other. Do we need to be reminded that the biblical fellowship of a uh, picture of fellowships, sorry, is one of inter interdependence, not of independence or codependence, but interdependence. That's the Romans 12 stuff, isn't it? The body of Christ metaphor at work. Whether that's PCC, staff team, leadership team or group, the Lord invites us into community, whether through each other's, sorry, where through each other's ministry, we're formed more and more into the likeness of Christ. We need each other in that process. And a helpful little framework that, um, that uh, Todd Bolsing, Bolsinger gives in his book, Canoeing the Mountains. I don't know whether you've um, come across that excellent book. He says that transformational leadership is made up of three elements. And he describes it as this little screenshot of the, of the page. Um, these three elements that make up transformational leadership, technical competence, adaptive capacity, and relational congruence. Now you have to explore more if you want to go into some of the detail, but he says the credibility gained in competence must be increased through acts of demonstrated character and constancy. He says, who would you rather as your guys, someone who's got the skills and experience or someone with integrity and who's trustworthy? And of course it's, it's, it's both that we need. And he says, so, so how, can we, you know, how can we thrive relationally? Well, it, um, you know, yes, by growing in our technical competence, but also by loving those God has placed around us, investing in those around us, building trust with those that God's placed around us. And so Bolsinger then um, ends that chapter. He quotes someone else. He said, there is one core principle for developing these relationships. People must be engaged in meaningful work together if they are to transcend individual concerns and develop new capacities. And that's, that brings me to thriving corporately thriving corporately and um and we'll come to the next one in a moment but thriving corporately just before we get there when i say corporately i mean collectively as a corpus a body a community and as a local expression of the body of christ you'll be called to outwork the greatest commandments and commission which means you will have goals and plans and priorities that you're focusing on in this term and the next year but it's so interesting what happens to those goals in a time of crisis and change. Early on in lockdown, I came across an article, which I haven't been able to find since, but um, released by Praxis. And they said that really you should get rid of everything except the first couple of pages of your strategic plan or, for example, you know, mission action plan in Anglican terms. Um, because it's, you know, because we may have some priority areas or an idea of how we're gonna to move towards our vision and the bigger picture, but sometimes we just need to hold them a little lightly. Um, this, this of course happened in, in the last couple of weeks, again, just when we're getting our heads around reconnecting with September and the autumn term strategically, perhaps some of us have been knocked off course because we rightly had to respond to national events and what an opportunity that was too. But again, it's holding the journey slightly, a little bit lightly. Um, we moved to Suffolk just last summer. Lots of country roads here. Twice in the last week, um, on my way to dropping the kids off at school, the road has been closed, and um, and we've had to plot a new course back to uh, back to our destination. The destination remained the same, uh, but Google Maps didn't tell me that the road was closed in advance. So we ended up being a little bit late on two occasions this 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 week the destination remained the same but we had to plan a new route and i think of paul's missionary journey and strategic plan that was redirected by the holy spirit on a on a, at least a couple of occasions in 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 acts let's be sure we're making uh, let's let's be making sure that we're spending time corporately listening to how god wants to lead us in this season and then of course thrive missionally you um you might have expected me to say that uh, especially as we're an anglican mission agency but um but i don't know about you in this season of challenge and, and change it's easy to think more in terms of maintenance than it is mission we feel like we should stabilize and rebuild but in your focus on 
rebuilding. Don't lose sight of the fact that rebuilding doesn't just mean maintenance. Rebuilding also means mission. There's that fabulous book, Divine Renovation, From Maintenance to Mission. I, I keep coming back to that time and again. Uh, in another way, he reminds us of the importance of helping our people see that they are salt and light in the world, that they are the salt and light on the front lines Sunday to Saturday. That's why the work of LICC and ambassadors work is so crucial. That's why we, we as an organization run these um, leading evangelism learning hubs. Again, it's just about nurturing face sharing cultures in our, in our church. It's such an important piece of work. Are our people clear about their calling to be missionary disciples wherever God has placed them? Because there is such an opportunity. There's this um, uh, in the BBC News last year, but also again in August, just, just gone. Young people in the UK are twice as likely as older people to pray regularly. A new survey has found. Um, Talking Jesus research recently found that one in three of our contacts are open to finding out more about our faith. In contrast, a few years ago, when it's one in five. Um, there's such openness. Stacey Dooley, you may have come across um, this journalist. She, she was, um, released a documentary, Inside the Convent. Such an interesting piece of pop culture, which I think points to wider, wider themes. Um, that she, she'd never considered being religious, but she was terrified about dying and recognized that sisters had such a peace about it. She had, you know, she had a genuine interest and she was even envious about the comfort that the, the, um, the, the sisters found in their, in their faith and, uh, and that they were able to turn, to turn to God in a time of need. So here are the five things as we think about thriving as, as leaders in this new reality and context, personally, vocationally, relationally, corporately and missionally. Let's spend a moment to, to just listen to anything God might have been saying to us um, just for a moment or two, and then Pam will tell us what's happening next. So just for a moment, let's have a, a, a moment of silence. Okay, folks, uh, we're going to put you in breakout rooms now so that you've got the chance just to find out what everybody else thought of that and share your, uh, maybe come up with some questions that you'd like to ask to Matt um, after the breakout room. You've only got 11 minutes, so make the most of the time and do appoint someone just to make sure that everybody gets the chance to speak. Um, but we'll see you back in 11 minutes for um, Q&A. Thanks so much, have fun. Uh, I think most people are back now. Um, what we need you to do now, please, folks, is to start writing some questions into the chat. Uh, it's great if you remember to put them in capital letters so that I see them, but don't worry. Otherwise, so that we can start addressing some of the things you've been thinking about as you've been hearing what Matt had to say. Um, while we're waiting for a few to come in, um, Matt, I wanted to ask you, you talked about listening to God as a community. Um, how, what, what might that look like in a church? How do you listen to God as a community? Yeah, I mean, we all have to work it out in our own context, don't we? But um, certainly speaking from the context that I was used to and leading in, uh, in, in Fulham, something that we would do um, uh, every year, we would um, make sure that we are getting some time as a PCC and leaders. Um, we would talk about leaders and leadership team um, to together as a you know whole Saturday having brunch together and then spending time in prayer and worship and different act, using different activities to um, you know to engage people in prayer and 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 listening and hearing what God might be saying through scripture through prayer through in in our time of worship. Um, uh, we would um, also you know. Uh, at the end, at every APCM, after every um, new PCC was formed, the first PCC that we, we got together, um, we would do a little um, 
you know, analysis of this, the strengths, also some of the weaknesses of the church community, but also some of the, you know, opportunities in front of us. And we would use that as an opportunity to, you know, just hold everything before God and say, look, you know, Lord, we're, we're in your hands. This is your work. Um, we do hold these things lightly and our priorities lightly. But, um, you know, we, there are different seasons and different things, but we try to get into a rhythm each year of praying and listening to God um as a as a leadership team as a pcc as a as a as a church so um different okay. i'm sure each you know there'll be lots of different ways of doing it, it representing this room others will have ideas but i um i would add to that make sure that you ask the young people and the children uh what they think god is saying to the church because often they hear much more clearly than adults who've got too many things going on in our heads um okay so there's um there are questions matt about how we address clergy working patterns when things are so busy and lots of people have very little admin support um so that what happens is if you try and go on a retreat or a holiday you work like a crazy thing up until just before you go and then you start work again like a crazy thing to try and deal with everything that's happened in the meantime is there any way we can do that better or find better support for that yeah, again, I mean, there's no easy answer, is there? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know whether I've, I landed on any good solutions or, or again, silver, silver bullets, but, um, you know, I just think in terms of managing ex expectations. So if you're, um, if you're going away on a retreat or getting some time out of the office, um, just making sure your PCC or church wardens are aware if that's the context you're in. Um, and maybe, you know, you could work together to see whether they could pick up some of the some of the um slack in 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 that in that time but yeah i think you i think I, I i had to just make sure that i was prioritizing um you know that was important and then you know and then work out the practicalities of that decision afterwards um involving other people as i needed to but again there's no there's no easy answer um it's it's a constant conversation isn't it um uh, pam I, you know what have what have you learned in your context I think what you said about prioritizing is really important. Um, often we feel that we have to do everything and we can't. Um, even with the most support in the world, this is a job that is never finished, is it? So we have to decide what we're going to give our limited time and attention to because all of us have limits and we don't want to admit it, but it is true. So thinking through what are the things we're going to say no to is just as important as thinking through the things that we're going to say yes to. Um, because if we are, if we're broken by what we do, by trying to do everything and too much, um, the knock on effects of church leaders getting exhausted are huge. Um, so it's in our interests and everybody else's interests to learn to be able to say no gracefully and firmly. We've also got a question, Matt, that comes up very often um, about managing volunteers. How can we thrive when we're just trying to plug the gaps all the time? Because um, for, in some places, a lot of people have stepped back. Um, and, and we hosted a webinar, you hosted, Pam, with, with James, a webinar on that very thing, which we've got a recording for on the on the YouTube channel. So if you haven't already seen that, do follow, follow that up because there's some there'll be some um, really practical helps in there. But, um, you know, I think it, again, <laughs> there's no, there's, there really is no easy answer. I think it's, we have to, we have to, um, you know, paint a picture of where we as a leadership team feel that God may be leading us to that the destination type conversation and piece of communication and find the people that, you know, that God may be drawing into that work. Um, you know, you know, rather than necessarily plugging a, a hole in a in in a rotor, we want to find the people that you know God is stirring to get involved in particular aspects of, of work. But on the on the other hand, there is often the need for us just to you know plug the rotor. So it's a it's a bit of both, isn't it? But part of our role is to uncover the gifts, the callings, the the uh, you know the opportunities for people as they step into what God's got for them. We, we did wonder in that webinar whether changing the language from volunteers asking for volunteers to talking about vocation, what God is calling people to do, as you just said, Matt, might begin to change 
how people respond to what they're doing, because we have heard stories also of in the last two years, new people stepping up to do things that they wouldn't have done before, particularly online things. Um, so the picture is, is mixed. Uh, Matt, there's someone, Paul says, uh, I love the slide which compared graphs with plant growing. How do you encourage plant growth as opposed to worrying about numbers growth? Uh, again, there's, there really isn't an, an easy answer for this, but just, just to, I guess, check our own hearts before God. Uh, whilst obviously we long for people to come to, uh, you know, more people to come to knowledge of, of Jesus, saving knowledge of Jesus and be transformed. We long for our congregations to thrive and grow and numerically. And, and we long to see, you know, all of, all of these things. And if you're a part of a particular network, there'll be particular values that you're that are championed in, within that network. And that's so important and that's so right. But at the same time, we have to hold that we have to hold that lightly and say, well, ultimately, this is God's work. We do what we have to do. We've we got to, you know, we do what's in front of us, um, but we trust God for, for the growth. You know, it's the, the one plants, the other, the other waters piece, isn't it? But God causes, causes the growth. And I, and I just, you know, it's so important to check that as ourselves as leaders. Uh, when I first planted the church in, in 2010 in, in, in Fulham, I think there was uh, a moment where I just maybe sense God, um, challenging me and um, making sure that I had my job description correct in my own mind and my own heart that um, my job wasn't to 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 you know to grow the church. Um, it was it was really simply to come alongside people and to help make disciples as part of the body of Christ, which is what he's it's his ministry anyway, um, and um, and to trust him with that. Thank you, Matt. Um, there, there are some questions around how on earth do you move a church or maybe a group of churches on when they don't want to go anywhere? Thank you very much. They're quite content with how things are or there's a um, as long as it sees me out, I'm fine. That there's no sense of um, vision for mission or younger generations. Any any guidance on that, Matt? I mean, Pam, you you're, you do a lot of work on this with with the thrive communities that you lead and i maybe maybe just to throw it back to you we'd, I, you know i'd love to hear what you'd what you'd say to that <laughs> yeah I, th I think what you said earlier about listening to god is absolutely key and beginning to help people to see that they're there for a purpose one of the very simple things you can do is ask a pcc why do you think we're here why are we here why why does this church exist why does this group of churches exist um, and just spend some time thinking about all the possible answers that can come up um, because God has purposes for his church but until we start asking that question we can't assume that people will know or will have absorbed the need to be people who share faith and want to see things grow um, so that's a good starting place why do our churches exist uh, you could spend half a PCC on that and um, talking it through um, and talking about what what people on the PCC are there for. Why are they on the PCC? Why were they willing to stand? What was what was going through their heads? Did someone press gang them or, or was it because they wanted things to stay the same or these are these are not comfortable conversations uh, and but if we get that stuff out in the open gently graciously and kindly we can begin to talk about maybe more about what god's purposes for our church or our group of churches are and a conversation like that can make a huge difference in in a in a pcc meeting agenda just carving out some time for that that would be a decision that you could make as a as a leader um, and that could really begin to change the conversation the narrative um, as a leadership team, if that's not something that's familiar in your context. And, and if you want to know more about that, as Chris recommends in the chat, uh, PCC Tonight, uh, the publication that comes from CPAS, is a really good one for helping people to think through those things, um, but also other issues around PCCs. Mm. Loads of great resources and links that people are posting in the chat awesome. as well. Um, yeah. So so do look out for those and we'll be posting a, a, on an email later or, or um, yeah, later on about um, with some resources and we might incorporate some of those as well that you're posting in there.
thanks for sharing. Thank you. There was a there was just a comment earlier, Matt, that I thought was worth just us talking about. Um, someone called the clergy shock absorbers. Um, part of the role is absorbing other people's anxieties and stress and helping them to grow in, in faith and and learn those things themselves. But sometimes, especially in a season of multiple crises, we get overwhelmed ourselves by all that we have absorbed. Um, and I think that underlines a lot of the stuff you were saying about looking after ourselves personally. But I wondered if there was anything else you wanted to say about that. No, I think you I think you've just you know, I think that comment is is so important, isn't it? Um, uh, uh, and, a, and a very you know, salient image almost of, uh, of being a shock absorber um, and making sure that we have the resource and, and framework around us, whether that's the spiritual director or retreats or whatever we need, um, uh, right expectations. Again, it's that um, the Church of England research that they, six um, things that clergy need to thrive. Uh, I thought it was very, very interesting. Some of those, you know, healthy boundaries, um, being aware of vulnerabilities, all those sorts of things. I think it's just an important conversation. Us personally, as leaders, we need to be having with ourselves or with a spiritual director or accountability partner, whatever, con you know, whatever's relevant in our context. Thank you. There's a, there's a little comment here saying that um, lots of people have very clear ideas about where they want the church to go. But when you're looking for people to make those things happen, suddenly they, you can't see them the dust or they're looking at the floor and don't want to, to be part of it. And I, 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 I've never tried this, but I wonder whether there's a way of saying, as we think about um, where we think God might call us, call us to be, please talk about things only that you're willing to help with hmm. rather than this is what we should be doing, but then there's no, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if you did that. I'll throw that out there in the hope that someone will have a go and tell me how it goes. And um, something, folks, that we would, something we would try and do in our context was, you know, if someone had an idea, uh, you know, give them, give them some space. Okay, great. If, you know, what, what, what does it, let's, let's explore that. What does it take to get that up and running as you're suggesting? Um, you know, can we work together to see how, how, you know, we can make that, make that happen. Um, and sometimes that led to a, you know, a one page proposal of what that could look like. Uh, other times it's just simple as a conversation afterwards. Um, you know, so just throwing that conversation back or quite comment back can sometimes yield some interesting results. Thank you, thank you, folks. We're running out of time. Um, all the resources that we've mentioned and some of the ones that you've put up here, we will, as Matt said, send to you, um, and we'll send uh, a link to that uh, later on. Um, we'd be really grateful if you could just give us a bit of feedback on this webinar by answering four quick questions via a poll, and the poll will come up in just a second. Um, for those of you who would like to, Matt and I will be around for another 20 minutes or so if you'd like to continue the conversation. I'm going to pray for us, so please don't do the poll until we've prayed together, and then you're free to leave once you've done the poll. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for these five areas that we need to pay attention to. And we ask that for each one of us, you will um, keep reminding us of the one area or the or one or two areas that you want us to think about in the next weeks. May your blessing rest on each person in Jesus' name. Amen. So the poll and go, but if you if you need to, but if you'd like to stay. Um, let's see if we've got some more questions coming in. Also, just um, a reminder, the next webinar, 15th of November, if you're um, if you're around, that's the next time we're, we're streaming a, a webinar, 15th of November, 10 o'clock. All welcome. We're going to be looking at what um, leaders are doing to promote growth in their churches. Um, Matt, what do you do when you're you're trying to get people to think about mission, but other people are trying to divide and rule, trying to complicate life or divide the leadership? Well, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, is there? Um, uh, again, it, it's difficult to say without knowing the, the context, but, um, uh, you know, I, you know, having a conversation with those people potentially as a, uh, separately 
uh, individually to find out, you know, what, what's where they're coming from to understand a bit of their position. Um, uh, and then see if that establishes any bridges. Um, but really, you've got to, as leaders, we're, we're, we're called to lead with our leadership team, our PCC, and we need to, we need to stick to our, stick to our guns and not be de derailed by any conflicting things, you know, as, as we feel under God that God's calling us to a particular destination. Um, with grace and with love and a bit of love and shoving, we can get people in the, um, you know, in the, in, in the right direction. But again, it's with an open conversation. Thank you, folks. I think there are a few enough of us now that if you've got a further comment or question, please unmute and speak out or wave a hand and we'll get some more conversation going. It's good to see some people in here I recognise as well. Thanks for coming along, everyone, today. No, no comments, no questions. Nobody waving a hand at me. Oh, yes, Adrian. Hi there. Um, yeah, something that I, I some, as a theme I sometimes work on with leaders is to try and try and separate them from their actual role in terms of their sense of identity. It's, it's a real challenge for those which have a strong vocational identity to say that, uh, number one, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Number two, there's a calling on your life which is bigger than just your current role. Um, because sometimes when we are so identified with our current role, um, anything that kind of feels a threat to our success in this role is more of a threat to us personally than perhaps it's healthy to be. I don't know whether it makes sense or not. So I often sort of say you are bigger than your current role. You have a calling on your life which may transcend different roles. And that just helps people sometimes to step out, just be a little bit more objective about what's going on for them right now and it, because it might be time for them to move on. Um, but it just gives them that bit more objectivity, which I think can sometimes help. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, I can see I can see huge value in that. Um, but when we with the type of job where you live on the job, it gets harder and harder, doesn't it, to separate yeah. out those two things? Yeah. Not Anybody either. else? Anybody else comment or question? In that case, um, we'll we'll close things down. Thank you so much for joining us. Do come back and join us uh, for the next one in November. God bless you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. God bless.